Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Equity mates, welcome back to the show, fellas. A lot has changed since we had you on the program last time, including, I'm going to hold up to the camera for those that are watching, a book. A book. Authors. <laughs> a book, <laughs> yeah. Well, th thanks for having us on. Um, you say a lot's changed, but it, it feels like, you know, we just keep doing the same thing, going going behind the microphone and uh, and recording uh, podcasts. I guess that's that's lockdown brain. But um, yeah, mm. it's exciting. The, the book is... The book's out. We wrote it at the end of last year and then went through uh, months and months of editing. Um, so we're pretty excited that it's now now finally out. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I know Kate and I um, are really excited to ask you a few questions, not only just about how you went writing it, but also you know, how it's been received and, and what have you. Um, so it took that long to go from writing it. Oh, I thought writing would be the longest part. Mm, doesn't seem nah, like East mode. You, yeah, we we think we we exist in a in a media where it's like uh, the the production and then release schedule is you know week on week. Books are months and months of uh, planning and editing and you know getting it all made. So yeah, it was a pretty long timeline. Um, but mm. it's you know we're we're pretty happy that it's it's out. Before we get into um, the actual books themselves itself. Uh, I just want to say congratulations on the podcast too. Like both series, get started investing in the equity mates, um, core kind of OG podcasts are both in the top five when I checked yesterday, which is huge. So congratulations to you both. Doing that while launching other podcasts, while building the empire, while writing a book. Jeez, what can't you guys do? It's uh, it's pretty impressive. So <laughs> kudos to you too. Um, Kate, so I know on. you've got. I know you've got some questions for the guys, so I'll just let you jump straight in. Yeah, I just, I, I mean, I thought we should start with the book. Owen still hasn't sent me his copy to read and I share Owen, my books with him the, all the time. So <laughs> I'm blaming him. <laughs> so okay, we'll send have, you a copy. We'll send you a copy. Don't worry uh, about thank it. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I, I mean, I am a big fan of books and I, I just love to know like, where did you start? Because you've, you've interviewed so many people over the years. Um, I, when we last spoke, we were both probably doing this as a bit of a side hobby um, and you've taken it full time. And how did you go from like thousands of hours of content and research and material and sort of narrow that down into a book of, I don't know how many pages it is, but uh, a couple hundred. <laughs> how, did, how did you do that? Uh, uh, I guess we we had we you know we we started this journey years ago uh trying to learn ourselves and we've made every mistake along the way when you know trying to learn how to invest and you know neither neither of us studied finance neither of us worked in finance but we wanted to learn and and we i guess taught ourselves and used the podcasts as an excuse to get smart people to talk to us and teach us and what what we found was that uh, you can teach yourself and you, you can learn to invest. Um, and really that, that was where we started. It was, you know, we just wanted to basically put down in writing everything that we'd learned, all the mistakes we'd made, um, some of the lessons from the experts we've spoken to, but, but really the starting point for us was this is what we wish we had in, you know, 2011 when we, Bryce and I first met or, 2014 when we were living together and I lost all my money on Slater and Gordon um you know th those those lessons were really valuable but if people can read the book and avoid making those mistakes um that's that's sort of what we wanted to achieve with the book 
Mm. I think uh, you'll be famous for your Slater and Gordon mistakes forever because I saw the <laughs> AFR article about it, big headline. So. Uh, I we, we have definitely milked that story for a lot of content, <laughs> but I thought the AFR article was pretty funny because it was basically like, this guy lost 100% of his money on an investment, now buy his book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, great selling point. Yeah. I presume back then you weren't starting with that much money though. No, no. But you know, I was at uni at the time and that money, that money counts a lot more because you know, mm. you're working a part-time job uh, and you're, you're trying to save, but um, you know, getting that, I think it was a thousand dollars to to start investing like that. That took a lot of time as a part-time uh, worker at uni. So it hurt. And I imagine the, the book writing process was quite daunting was there any bits that you found particularly difficult to write about or communicate to a a wider audience I think for us we were very fortunate that we'd done a podcast called get started investing that had hours and hours of content and we'd spoken about the topics in the book you know for a couple of years so you know it it really the, the challenge was just getting it all onto paper in in the timelines that we had um and I think, you know, it was something that we were pretty passionate about getting getting down. And, and um, as Alex said, it's a book we wish we had. Um, I did have to challenge Ren, though, because I wanted to get a section in there what? going. Sorry, to- the world's shaking. Yeah, that's we're like having a- like an earthquake. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Are you guys experiencing that? No. The whole thing. House no. is shaking. Yeah. Maybe just um, just get yourself somewhere a little bit safe. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting that, too. Are uh, well, serious? you guys go. Well, hope, we're hope like, okay. I don't know. We're like Owen and I live to like an hour apart, so it's weird that that's happening. What, is this weird that this is being recorded? I know. I know. <laughs> Amazing content. It'll go yeah. viral. <laughs> <laughs> Yours was really shaking, Owen. Your yeah. camera. Yeah. It was like crazy. The, yeah. the whole house was moving. I thought the like the windows would smash. Oh my god. Yeah. So we just had an earthquake in Melbourne. We think. Yep. And um, we had a mild interruption to regular programming, but we were talking about your pandemic project, Kate, and I think you had one more question for the guys. Yeah, I mean, pandemics just doesn't seem important if we have an earthquake. But um, um, yeah, I think just on top on the topic of the book, like how did you pick what to share and what what was most important for someone getting started with investing to start with, essentially? Yeah, it's a it's a tough one to figure out because you know we've learned so much in in the journey and and you you start by saying you want to fit everything in the book and uh, it, it very quickly becomes too much. Um, so we we really just wanted to sort of go step by step and focus on what we thought was important for people getting started. And and the great thing is because we've got this equity mates community we get a lot of questions and we hear what people's biggest challenges are. So we, we had a pretty good guide in terms of where people, where the barriers that people felt, where, where the barriers were um, that were stopping people getting started. And we, we really just focused on that. Um, but we, we have a bit of a catch-all section at the end, which was lessons we wish we knew when we got started. And that, that really let us just put, put other stuff in that we thought um, was important to include in the book. But there was one big debate that Bryce and I had because the most common question we get at Equity Mates is, is what broker should I sign up with? And for so many people, that decision paralysis at that point in time, you know, there's over 30 options in terms of brokers in Australia. It's um, confusing for people that don't understand, you know, financial markets and chess sponsorship and, you know, individual hints and all that stuff. And a lot of people give up at that point and say, this is too hard. Uh, so Bryce wanted to include everything and, and when I say everything I mean everything about brokers <laughs> and I, I thought it was a, uh, a little bit too much and we should just focus on what people need to know. Uh, so our compromise was a, the, the modern day equivalent of a sealed section in the middle of the book. We, uh, we changed the page colour and I let Bryce just write to his heart's content. So when you pick up the book you'll see a number of grey pages in the middle that's Bryce's uh, everything you need to know about brokers section. Um, but other than that, uh, I think, you know, we, we sort of knew where the, where the pain points were and that that's really what we wanted to, to help people with. 
Mm. And that's like great. You had that community as a feedback tool to really work out what people needed to know. And I, I think I personally forgot into a few months ago that brokers were a point that people were getting stuck with because we've just had so many questions in the last few months, especially because there's so many new brokers popping up. And so there's even more choice for consumers and they just, um, it like, it, it really is a sticking point. So having that resource is fantastic in the book. Mm, mm. Yeah, there's not an easy answer to that question, which is which is frustrating. Um, but I mean, it's good. There's competition, and you know, costs are coming down, and technology is improving. Um, but you know, it's it would be it would be a lot cleaner if there was just one that was head and shoulders better than everyone else. But um, unfortunately, people have to make that choice. So hopefully, Bryce's sealed section can help them make that choice. <laughs> Do you have to crack it open? No, I we wanted that. That would have been <laughs> yeah, epic. We <laughs> It's like those magazines you had when yeah, you were a kid. Yeah, that you yeah, rip it down the side. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't know if the publishers, um, we didn't get that far in terms of conversation, but the yep. the compromise was the grey pages. I'm happy with that. I hear it's the most read <laughs> section of the book to date. So. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I can see it right here. And there's a, yeah, there's a solid few pages on it. So what have we got? Yeah, 186. So it's, yeah, like 10 or 15 pages covering that. So that's very comprehensive, mate. Well done. Um, I might switch gears a bit and start talking about kind of the, the podcast, the business and what you guys are building and what you've learned from your journey. Um, I know it's probably been like the last 12 to 18 months, you guys have made a transition within the equity mates business from kind of being something that, you know, really was growing really well and you were doing while still trying to juggle work. And now it's like a full-time empire basically. So I'm just curious to know how you guys went about making that transition and like pain points, what, what your kind of lessons learned were stepping across. It, it wasn't like just a, a clean break for us. It's not like we woke up one day and said, today's the day we're going full time and then let's figure everything out. We, I think we were pretty fortunate that we were able to juggle our corporate gigs for a number of years as we progressively sort of slowly transitioned this from a side hustle to the point where it was a business long before we kind of quit work. And, and when we did quit, we felt we were pretty confident that what we had in front of us was at least a runway for 18 months, 24 months of being able to at least give it a crack. So in terms of that feeling of, oh my God, I, I, I don't know what's going on. We, we don't know what's in front of us. Um, you know, we kind of worked through that together while still taking the paycheck from our corporate gigs, which gave us a sort of a bit more of a sense of security. I certainly held on a lot longer than Ren did in terms of quitting. I, I wanted to just really make sure that when we did leave, we kind of knew what we, what we were doing. Um, and I still think we're figuring a lot of it out. The, the business side of things is, um, is where we're really, I guess, challenging ourselves around the, the, the mix and dynamic between commercializing versus building an audience versus understanding that it's okay to lose money and, um, and, you know, battling through all that sort of stuff is always challenging and bringing on team members is incredibly challenging. Um, you know, what type of manager are we going to be? How do we want to build a team? All of that sort of stuff that, you know, we didn't really think about when it was just the two of us. And, and now um, it's not just podcasting, you know, we've got to be building this business. So it's, I've loved it though. The whole experience, I'm just absolutely loving. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's been a pretty impressive journey for you guys. Like just seeing how you've done it. It seems like from the outside, you say you're still learning and whatever, and there's been challenges. But um, I think like, it seems like it's been pretty deliberate at least. Ren, just a quick question on that, just to follow up. Um, do you guys like outline like a business plan? Do you guys sit down and talk strategy and think this is an opportunity for us? Um, for, for people that listen to your podcast, read the books and stuff, they, um, they probably don't realize how much like there is a balance between nurturing the audience and, and making it a viable business. So I'm just keen to pick your brain on that, how you kind of balance those priorities. Yeah, I'm glad it looks deliberate from the outside. Um, that it sometimes doesn't feel deliberate. I mean, I, look, we we realize, um, you know, we 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 have a business plan and we have we have a lot of ideas. Um, the i the amount of ideas we have compared to our ability to execute them 
execute on them is probably a bit out of whack. But I, I think for us, you know, we we see that there's, you know, that we we've built this audience and there, but like the the reason that we built this audience is that there's so many people that are just like us that never learn about investing at school, never learn about it at uni, uh, never learn about it from their parents, and so were kind of locked out or like felt that they were locked out. And we we know that as long as we're doing things to try and help solve that problem and try and help people understand financial markets and get started investing, um, that's that's really why equity mates exists and that that everything we do needs to be, I guess, in service of that mission. And so, you know, we've got the book out, we've got a number of podcasts, we've got a streaming show, but it, it, it's all at the end of the day focused on making markets accessible and understandable and you know, we've got more ideas that we that we want to sort of execute on in the future, but uh, it all sort of it, it really just ties back to that. And so, um, you know, we're going to throw things at the wall. Things will fail. Some things will go well, um, and hopefully, it keeps looking deliberate. But I think behind the scenes, it's very much trying to figure out, you know, what what where we can add value and where we can do things better than traditional financial media or you know things that the industry aren't doing or people that the industry have sort of traditionally left behind if we can service them that's great but the other thing is the broader media landscape is so uncertain you know when we all started our podcasts podcasting wasn't really a business like you know people these days are starting a podcast and going full time from day dot and you know they're getting incredible producers and incredible sound quality and making incredible shows but back when we were starting it was you know there were some big shows like serial joe rogan and stuff were were out there but it was very much a hobbyist medium and the industry has changed massively around us in the past 4 years and it's going to keep changing so i think any business any business plan that we put together 4 years ago would have been outdated very quickly because the industry changed so much and i expect in 4 years time we'll be saying the same thing and i think that's such a, an important lesson for any person that wants to start a business or a side hustle it's, it's been adaptable to the changing landscape and also as you said throwing things at a wall and seeing what sticks like sometimes you will fail but it's about getting back up again and I, I think that's a fantastic lesson to take away uh, like I mean all of us like when we started it was all just sort of very new just a bit of fun on the side and I mean it's I don't think any of us could have predicted the the growth of podcasts over the last sort of three four years. No, it's been incredible. I mean, the biggest lesson for me is you we got into a medium early and the the like the rising tide lifting all boats has helped all of us. And you can see that uh more recently with TikTok. Like you see influencers that were early on TikTok, and as more users have jumped on, it's again just that rising tide lifting all boats. And you know, if we ever sell equity mates or if Bryce decides he's sick of me and, and wants to quit or anything like that I think whatever I try and start next you, you got to try and skate where the puck is going because um, you know Bryce and I were in supermarket retail that consistently grinds out three percent growth year on year and you compare that experience to the experience of being in an industry that's growing at such a fast rate and it's just chalk and cheese. Mm. It's almost like if you don't grow fast enough with everybody else, you just kind of get left behind, especially with podcasts. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to talk a bit about, because you've got such a, a wealth of information from your community and your audience, what are some of the, the biggest investing trends you've seen over the last year or so with your community? A big one for me, and it's probably no surprise, but the... Uh, the interest that ESG is now starting to have and, and the focus that people are trying to um, have when it comes to investing sustainably or having that as a lens um, when they're building a portfolio. And I think, as I said, no surprise, you know, a lot of products coming out now have that sort of focus. A lot of the fund managers and um, listed products, um, you know, are, are sort of catering to the demands of the in, uh, investing world at the moment. Um, yeah, so I think it's interesting that People who are first starting as well are starting out saying, I want to build a portfolio that is sustainable or has an ESG focus um, right from the get-go, which is something that when we started five years ago, certainly wasn't, um, wasn't as prolific as it is now. And um, I think it's only going to continue that way. And, um, you know, we talk of getting to a point where there won't be such a thing as sustainable investing because 
all companies are going to have to in some way, shape or form um, be able to prove that they are, you know, able to fit under that sort of banner. I think it's a, it's a great thing that consumers and investors are demanding more from companies and demanding that they actually do better by the community and their culture, their employees, their customers, their environment. So I think, yeah, as you mentioned, it will just become a part of investing rather than this mm. segregated niche. Mm, mm. Although it's challenging at the moment with, you know, a lot of companies will say that they have some form of ESG, put it in the report as a bit of a buzzword. And you, you got it, it's difficult at the moment to really understand what does ESG mean to you? And then how do you apply that in your investing? I don't think there's any, you know, amazing tool out there at the moment that lets you kind of say, this is how I want to invest sustainably. And it'll give you a list of companies that kind of tick all those boxes because, um, sustainable ESG to me is different to ESG to Ren is different to ESG to the both of you. So, um, yeah, I think there's a massive opportunity for someone to come out and really own that, um, own that sort of process of helping beginners or everyone, um, with their ESG journey. Trademark, yeah, we sure. might do that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> giving away the ideas here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get started ESG coming soon. <laughs> Hold on, that's uh, not bad. <laughs> um, no, we, yeah, we have, an, we have an ethical investing course and it, it, it was slow to take off, but I think it's just one of those ones where people just trickle in because they're just slowly getting more and more interested in it. Um, I thought... An interesting way you talked about this kind of catch-all at the back of the book here, uh, but I thought an interesting way to kind of maybe see how you, your individual journeys have, has changed is just to talk about the two things that have changed your mind since you like about investing since you began. Um, feel free to take them one at a time. Maybe Ren, we can start with you, mate. Some of the things that have changed your mind or changed the way you invest. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was wrong about a lot of things. Uh, in the in the early days of investing um and i think uh, a pretty vanilla one but i think a really important one for uh beginner investors um when when i started investing i thought you had to buy individual companies and uh the famous slater and gordon story was was really where it started um for me and that was because i just didn't know about index funds or etfs and you know, the four of us sitting here on this uh, on this podcast, you know, we all know about ETFs, we know about index funds, and we talk about them all the time. But so many people that I speak to that don't, you know, that, that don't listen to investing podcasts or make investing podcasts for a living, just aren't aware that you don't have to make that decision, that you can just buy a little bit of everything. And I, I think, you know, it, it's just such a good way to start. For me, looking back at that Slater and Gordon purchase, if I just bought some S&P 500 ETF uh, and held it from, you know, 2014, 2015 to now, uh, I would be very happy with myself. Um, and so for me, that's a really vanilla one, a really simple one, but I think a really important one for people that are daunted by the amount of choice and the amount of work that it, you need to do to start investing in individual companies forget it you don't have to how about you bryce anything from you like any big things that have changed your mind since you started this journey i always used to see uh you know all these fund managers and the warren buffets of the world pumping out massive returns by stock picking kind of on what alec was saying there and so when i started i thought you know you needed to try and pick stocks to beat the market but you know over the last five years, it's been very clear that there is no real need to try and beat the market. You, you can take some passive approaches and, and the power of the market return, the average market return over a long period of time is more than adequate for an, an investor who doesn't have the time to do research into ind individual companies. And, and we know that fund, manage, fund managers themselves um, often struggle to beat the market as well, particularly in an environment like this where the market's just pumping out ridiculous returns. So mm -hmm. for me, there, yeah, the, the biggest learning has, and the comfort comes from uh, knowing that there's really nothing wrong with with a market return and and taking that over a long period of time, you, you're going to do very well as an investor. Mm. <clears throat> and I think um, that's something that I've thought about for. A good five five or so years now i think it's hard because 
our kind of businesses and our organizations, platforms, whatever, you, however you want to define them, um, people come in with those preconceptions about what investing is and what it isn't. And the things that still attract people uh, are still kind of like the flashing lures, things of like riches, um, greed and fear. Like those are the things that drive people to investing typically. And as much as we want to say like rationally, you can do this and this will be okay. And they, they always want to, like, there's always someone, well, there's a lot of people that do it actually that want to own individual companies. And I think for me, if I could just reflect on that for a second, it's kind of like, you can do that, but why not still just have a plan B, which is ETFs and index funds. Like there's no harm in having both. You don't have to choose. So yeah, I think that's a really good reflection from you too. I'm like, I'm all aboard that one. Kate, I know, I know you're, you're trying to, in, you're trying to improve your interviewing skills as we all are. <laughs> and I think you've got, a, you've got a kind of uh, something to pick from the brains of these two gents. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. Uh, Owen loves uh, loves sharing our private lives on air. But anyway, um, <laughs> always throwing a curveball. No, I saw you guys. Um, I think was it a few months back? But you had you were challenging yourselves to interview someone from every ASX two hundred company. Yes, the ASX two hundred challenge. Yeah. Yeah. How are you going on that? Oh, we are well and truly into it. We have 195 to go. <laughs> no, no, no. We've done more than five. Uh, not ASX 200, I don't think. We've oh, done a okay. number of CEOs, okay. but in terms of ASX 200. But we, yeah, I mean, we don't have an, we don't have 200 interview spots in a year. So that that's the first challenge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Multi-year goal. Uh, but I thought it was just a good challenge because for us at Equity Mates, we've spoken to over 150 experts and we've spoken about this a lot in the book. And one of the things that they say is understanding management, and I've heard the both of you talk about this numerous times as well, but understanding management is one of the most important things you can do as an investor uh, when you're trying to build a thesis around a company. And so for us, we just want to give our audience as direct sort of access to uh, CEOs and business leaders as we can. And there's no better way to do that than in, grab them and interview them on the show and, and ask them questions directly about their business. And, and for us, the ASX 200, biggest 200 companies in Australia, why not start there? So um, yeah, a long way to go, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just know any, we, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> just wait until we do the S&P 500 challenge next year. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Russell 3000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when you when you get these ceos on the show whether they're in the sex 200 or maybe a little bit um expanded from that what are your favorite questions to ask them to draw out the really good good stuff that your community wants to know about so i think uh there, there's a few there's a few I guess staples that we have in every interview. Um, we we love to talk about people and culture because we find that's one thing that is incredibly hard to get from any other information source. You you can kind of get a, a glossed over sense of it from an annual report, but you know really you've got to hear how these company leaders approach uh, building a team and. Uh, building a culture and stuff like that. So that's always an important one. Um, we love to hear them describe their company in their own words. But but for us, you know, the the main the main thing is, you know, all, all of these businesses are just incredibly, you know, working incredibly hard, hire, trying to hire the best people and, and trying to, you know, solve big problems, be it give us things we want or solve, you know, challenges that the world is facing. And, you know, we for me, I love to hear that story and to hear the story of like what, what they're trying to do and, and how, how they're trying to do it. And, you know, there, there are so many people that will nitpick about certain companies at certain points in time. But I think like as long-term investors, we have to understand what's the reason, what's the thesis that an investor would have to hold this company for in like a decades long time horizon. And, I think really trying to get to the bottom of that and truly, tr really trying to understand like what, what, how the company creates value and how it thinks about, you know, creating more value into the future. Uh, that, that's really, you know, as investors, what, what it all comes down to. Mm. It's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to define, isn't it? Culture and uh, talent. But at the end of the day, it's, even though we move, we're moving rapidly towards more automation, things like artificial intelligence, it's still, at the end of the day, it's still great people. 
mm. that, that create yeah. those tools and those services for their customers. So it, um, it, yeah. it's, it's so. funny how many people say that, like how many expert investors that we've spoken to that say that, how many CEOs say that it's not about, you know, moats or technological advantage or it, it's about people. And yet as investors, we seem to always start at the opposite end of the spectrum with like ratios and margins and numbers. Um, and obviously mm. they're incredibly important and they, they give us a lot of the story, but that people and culture piece is, is something that I think we need to be, needs to be more front and center. Mm. Again, great opportunity for someone and capture that market and help people understand <laughs> management. <laughs> um, my next, my question for you guys is we, I talked about the, the things that have changed your mind, but maybe um, we can pick your brains just to understand how your personal investment approaches have changed. Maybe um, as Ren takes a sip, maybe we'll start, start with you, Bryce. Um, th- anything that's like changed the way you invest and how kind of it, that's shifted over the years? Yeah, if I think back to when when I started investing and then when Ren and I kind of started investing together, the international opportunities and the thought of investing into international businesses wasn't really a thing just because it was so expensive to do so and access was actually pretty limited. I think the only broker at the time that I was aware of was Comsec and perhaps Nabtrade as well. Incredibly expensive to do so. So I had a very sort of home country bias and was just investing here in Australia. So for me, one of the biggest changes has been has been um, bringing that international focus investing not only in the US but you know Europe New Zealand like all these markets around the world um, you know we speak through speaking to so many experts you you really get the opportunity to see how amazing investing is when it gives you that opportunity to invest in the best companies around the world so it, that's been a big change for me is getting out of the tiny market that Australia is and and embracing the opportunity that is around the world. Mm. I think that's, that's a huge thing. I think, yeah, just going, reflecting on that. I think when I started investing, which is about 10 years ago, um, there was only like 7% of people that invested outside Australia. And now that number's a lot higher thanks to many great brokerage platforms, but just the costs and information as well. It's just been huge. Like innovation has definitely come to the investment industry in that respect. How about you, Ren? Anything, anything from you, Matt? Yeah, I think um, Nick Griffin, uh, the CIO at Munro Partners, uh, gave mm. us a stat that has really stayed with me and um, I think has informed a lot of my investing decisions when I am thinking about investing in individual companies. And, and that is that it's just 4% of listed companies that drive all of the excess return in the stock market. It's, you know, and then I think it's about half sort of get the market average return and then the rest do less. Um, but that, that it, the, the challenge for us as long-term investors is, is finding that 4% of companies that will be the next leg of the, the market's journey upwards. And, you know, if we think back historically, we, we, we know what those companies are. Like in this, in, you know, speaking in 2021, it's pretty obvious. It's the, the Facebooks, the Apples, the Amazons, the Microsofts. But in previous generations, it was, you know, the Walmarts and the Boeings and, and stuff like that. Like these exceptional companies are the ones that drive the overall market return. And for me, reflecting on that and really trying to internalize that in my investing decisions, it, it it's really about like not taking swings at things that are okay. And, you know, like... We, we love looking at small caps and we love thinking about how, you know, if they get included in an index or if they just get another contract and stuff like that, you know, they're, they're, they, could, they could go to the moon and they could 10 bag. But, but really the, the driver of long-term gains isn't okay companies being added to indexes or added to active managers' portfolios. It's exceptional companies just continuing incredible growth journeys. And for me, that's, that's really what investing is today. It's, it's where, where's that next exceptional company coming from? That's, that's a very hard thing to find, isn't it? That, well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> if it was easy, we'd all that's be doing it. the name it. of the yeah. game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, I, I'd love to hear from both of you, if you could go back and talk to your 18 year old self, and I'm sure you reflected on this a bit while you were writing the book, um, you could tell yourself 
one lesson about money and business, what would it be? Buy Amazon. Yep. That's a, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> 10 years. Well, I don't know how old you guys are. So I won't, I won't say 10 years. It might be younger than that. I, th- I think for me, uh, I didn't grow up in a household that, uh, you know, I learned about investing and I, I came to investing relatively early. Luckily, I came across Bryce at uni and we started talking about it. Um, but even between the time that I was 18 and the time that I actually started, invest- started investing, I missed out on like four or five years of compounding growth. And, you know, if you put that in a money smart calculator and you look at that that time between 18 and 23 and what that could mean you know when you're 60 it, it matters so i think the obvious answer is is get started investing early uh but but i think i think more generally i just wish i was more more curious when i was 18 and like you know now we've created this platform and you know bryce and i can spend our days being curious and just like learning about new companies, learning about different industries and investing as an exercise forces you to be curious because you're constantly trying to learn new things. And and I love that about that. And I kind of just wish I was more curious when I was younger. For me, I love that. (laughs) Tough act to follow, Bryce. I know. (laughs) (laughs) No, look, for me, I've always been pretty disciplined with money. I was fortunate to grow up in a family where they really um, sort of instilled the value of money into us and some really good money habits. And we speak about that in the book, you know, getting your money sorted and saving and stuff. But I think that's at some points in my life took away from enjoying sort of what I'd created and and built from the money. And so, so I'd probably tell my 18 year old self to enjoy it a little bit more and not be so disciplined all the time because you, you can always earn back money, but you can never really get time back or your age back and so um yeah i I, i'd I'd probably say relax on the discipline at some points in time um and then in terms of business i would just say learn to code yeah that is (laughs) a good one (laughs) yeah Yeah. that's a pretty darn good answer too to that that uh yeah awesome so on the one hand we've got um ren saying that basically like didn't have necessarily those money habits and kind of regrets not doing more of kind of the investing and all that kind of money, maybe just some general money smarts earlier. And then Bryce, you're saying that maybe there was too much of that and maybe that was kind of like a point of anxiety or something like that, because you were trying to like save more and kind of be disciplined. Whereas you could have loosened the range just a little bit. And I think when we go on air and talk about things like this, I think it, people would tend to with confirmation bias they tend to listen to what they want to hear so some people hear you say oh i wish i just loosened the reins a bit and then they're like can't take it with you and that's how i'm going to live my life (laughs) and then the other side is like oh i wish i started earlier and then like oh i'm going to be super disciplined that's what i'm going to do but really it's about balance right yeah like i feel like that's the combination of your two answers is like have balance and try and find that for yourself yeah absolutely we would we were chatting to someone yesterday about the fire movement and, you know, neither Bryce and I would say we're fire movement proponents, but I think the really important thing that comes out of the fire movement is, is really being intentional with your money. And it's, you know, spending on things that, that you want to spend on or because, you know, it brings you joy, makes you happy, or it's meaningful to you, but it, then it's about not spending on unnecessary things. And I think that where the middle ground lies between Bryce's, you know, late teens and my late teens was I wasn't intentional because I didn't have enough knowledge. And Bryce perhaps was too intent, like wasn't, you know, he was too restrictive and he didn't, um, you know, spend money on things that, that would have brought him joy or, you know, were meaningful to him at that time. And I think the middle ground is like, just be really aware of how much money's coming in and what you're spending it on. And if there's something you want, don't, deprive yourself of that but if it's something that you can sort of take or leave don't spend it invest that money instead yeah Mm. i think that's really important and like finding that balance is very hard and it takes takes years to find out what you want to spend money on and what doesn't bring you joy but once you get to that point it it really empowers you to move forward in a way that's going to set you up for your a great financial future but it's also going to allow you to live in the moment and not live in the future or the past 
Yeah. And like, it's, it's a journey. Like, I don't think any of us sitting here would be like, we've nailed this, you know, we're, we're finance podcasters and we know exactly what we're doing and you guys should listen to us because we've got our money sorted. I think it's, you know, it's going to be a journey for everyone throughout their lives and you're never going to be perfect at it. But the important thing is that you're just constantly trying to be better at it. And be curious. I like, I love that. I think I, I was listening to a podcast the other day with Neil deGrasse Tyson and that he had the exact same message about learning and life and just bringing a really curious approach to things. And that makes everything a lot more fun and interesting as you go about it. It also builds resilience into your, your life in other ways too, right? Like in terms of your career, if you're curious, you're going to learn to adapt quicker than other people and you're going to adapt to change and all those types of things. So that kind of flexibility is super important. And mm-hmm. hey, we've got um, kind of one more question here. Uh, which is what's the number one challenge you guys see new investors facing? The book is called Get Started Investing. So what's the number one challenge that they face and how do you suggest they overcome it? For me, it is that a lot of people feel they need to know everything before they get started and that there needs to be oodles amounts of research done and they need to know the best company or the best ETF available. And that that's the, the, the only way to start. And that can be incredibly paralyzing because you're never going to know everything before you start. There is no sort of absolute best ETF for the rest of your life. You know, what's the best ETF to invest for the next 50 years? Well, I mean, that's going to change over time. So for for me, and we try to address this in the book, it's really just having enough confidence to take that first step. And then a lot of it will flow from there. You'll be in the market, you'll be more engaged, you'll be thinking more actively about it. And and for me, um, that's really yeah what we've tried to capture in the book. I think there's one page in there where we just literally have one line that says, you don't need to know everything to get started. Um, and then sort of like just carry on reading just as a reminder, <laughs> just as a reminder, <laughs> as a, a reminder one. that you don't need to know everything. And a lot of people get stuck at that barrier before they even get money in the market. Mm-hmm. How about you, Rent? I think, you know, for me, there's a lot of uh, specific barriers that we've touched on in the book and that we can talk about, you know, uh, people uh, being unsure about what broker to sign up with or do they have enough money to get started or is investing just like gambling? You know, these are some of the sort of common questions we get. You know, we also over and over again, um, people are looking for the perfect stock or the perfect ETF like Bryce was mentioning and, you know, Um, I think there's a lot of specific things, but I think generally the biggest barrier is a mindset thing. It's that investing isn't for me, that it's something that I would love to know, but I'm not able to do it. It's too hard. I don't have enough information. um, And so I'm not going to try or, you know, I I might lose my money, so I'm not going to try. No one's going to have a worse invest, worse start to investing than me. Um, and no one is going to know everything when they get started. And you'll make mistakes, you'll lose money, you'll learn from that. But having that mindset that I'm just going to do it and I'm going to get started with an imperfect investment with imperfect amounts of information, but I'm going to be better the second time around and the third time around and the fourth time around, I think is is the most important thing because then you're at least jumping in and you're you're making those mistakes and you're getting started. But for so many people, that mindset of it's not for me just just never lets you get out of the starting blocks. And that, and that's a real shame. Taking it step by step is so important. And I think probably for all four of us, like 99% of what we know about investing now is things we've learned after we took that very first step. Yeah, mm. yeah mm. absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't, um, like if you want to learn how to play soccer, for example, you don't necessarily go and read the rule book you know, end to end and really understand every single different pass or strategy before you actually just go and try kicking the ball yeah. um, to see if you like it. Right. So yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, yeah it's, Even if you, it if you think about like, if you went to uni or you went to school and then you started a job, like how much knowledge you picked up at uni compared to when you actually were boots on the ground day one in your job and you realized you knew nothing. And then you really learned on the job. It's exactly the same as investing. Like, book learning will only get you so far you gotta you gotta give it a crack yeah mm. hey i was just on the the website and noticed the new the new site equitymates.com is up and running yeah wow. finally. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. looks great guys are you Thank happy you. with it 
Yeah, yeah Bryce, happy Bryce finally it. learnt to code. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why it took two years. <laughs> and we're really happy with really it. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Phase one, there's still a few things that we want to switch on and and um, continue to pr- provide value for for the audience. But yeah, we're really happy with how it's turned out and um, really bringing all of our shows and the community together. So yeah, yeah. check it out if you haven't. Equimates.com. Yeah. yeah. And um you know, you can find out more about all of the different podcast series that the guys have have got going on. Um, you can filter by episodes and topics that you want, you know, to listen to. So that's really neat too. Um, how about if people wanted to buy the book, Get Started Investing, where should they go today to, to grab a copy? Um, head to Booktopia or Amazon, probably the two best places. We've got plenty of links on our social media. Um, and yeah, you can head there if you're following us on Instagram um but yeah it's it's in bookshops i have seen a few photos come through from uh not here in sydney haven't been able to get out and see if there are any but um my parents are in wagga and there is two copies in wagga on a shelf so (laughs) i love to see so (laughs) if you're one of bryce's schoolmates from wagga go and buy those two copies so they have to reorder exactly (laughs) exactly did your parents move it to prime position so (laughs) everyone can see (laughs) they probably both bought both copies but uh (laughs) no yeah that's super cool um well done guys well done on everything you've created on educating so many people and um yeah thanks for joining kate and i on the show today we really appreciate it thanks owen thanks kate and i think back to you guys as well we love what you guys are doing and um full full respect on on your side as well and um hope to continue to see the growth of rask as well so it's been a yeah pleasure. and hope to see your books in bookshops uh so <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll watch see. this space we'll see we'll see what happens <laughs> Ah, cool guys awesome work Kate as always thanks for joining me thanks for listening guys